Queen Elizabeth II has ditched a horse-drawn carriage for a Bentley. And in place of a crown and royal robes, the monarch has delivered her speech to Parliament in a hat and dress. While her arrival and attire is a break from tradition, her message is all too familiar. My government's priority is to deliver the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union on the 31st of January. Her speech comes a week after Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Conservative Party won its largest parliamentary majority since Margaret Thatcher. It's a victory built around one message. I wonder if you can guess what this parliament is going to do once we put the withdrawal of agreement back. We're going to get Brexit done. Mr. Speaker, I think, I think, even, I think even, your, even your parrot, uh, Mr. Speaker, would have been able to cite that one by now. With the road to Brexit now clearer than ever, Downing Street has set its sights on hammering out a trade deal with the EU. Johnson's government has given itself until the end of next year, ruling out any extension past that deadline. But Brussels calls the timetable unrealistic, urging the UK to be more flexible for its own sake. In case we cannot conclude an agreement by the end of 2020, we will face again a cliff-edge situation. And this would clearly harm our interests, but it will impact more the UK than us. The EU says failure to reach a trade pact would be just as harmful as a no-deal Brexit. The UK's own projections show the economy would shrink significantly, and that's bad news for Queen and country. Paulo Montesillo, TRT World. Let's get more on the story now with Jonathan Porters. He's a professor of economics and public policy at King's College London. He's also a senior fellow at the university's independent research body on UK-EU relations. Welcome back to the program, Jonathan. No surprises that Brexit dominated the Queen's speech, but is there anything outside the UK Parliament that could stand in the way of the UK leaving the EU by January 31st? Um, it's vanishingly unlikely. The um, UK Parliament, um, after the election, will have a clear majority for Boris Johnson to push through the withdrawal agreement bill, which is what's needed on the UK side. Meanwhile, although the European Parliament will undoubtedly make some noises, uh, the European Union as a whole clearly wants to get Brexit done almost as much as Boris Johnson does at this point, because they're fed up with it. Uh, so I think while the European Parliament, which also has to ratify the deal will uh, uh, will will make some noises. In the end, they too will vote overwhelmingly in favour, and that's all that is needed to 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 ensure Brexit by January the 31st, as the Prime Minister has promised. Mm. Now, with that first phase of the Brexit battle seemingly over, it now moves on to the next phase, and that's the transition period after the official withdrawal. We heard the new EU President Ursula von der Leyen there warn that perhaps they might need to extend that period beyond 2020. Boris Johnson reportedly wants to legislate against that in the UK Parliament. What is the danger of him doing that? Well, I think, frankly, uh, legislating uh, against an extension is pure political theatre. It's totally meaningless because, of course, um, what Parliament could legislate, Parliament can unlegislate as well. Um, and parliamentary approval would be, would be required anyway for any extension. Um, so I think we should ignore that. That's just the usual Boris Johnson uh, um, political theatre. Um, but the Prime Minister has made a very clear commitment not to extend. And to many observers, it looks like the UK is repeating precisely the mistakes that it made in the first phase of the negotiation. That is, it's setting... Um, as it did by notifying Article 50, it's setting up a hard deadline after which there will be a cliff edge for UK businesses in the UK economy. And that, of course, um, weakens the UK's negotiating position. So um, once again, we seem to be repeating almost precisely the same negotiating strategy that served us so badly over the last three years, which is setting an unrealistic deadline um, and then um, realising as we come up against that deadline that we are in a very weak position indeed and really will have to take whatever terms are offered us or, or something fairly close to that. So it's not a great look. No, but we know stranger things have happened in UK politics. Could the UK and the EU feasibly reach a trade deal in that 11-month transition period? 
Um, I think the, the answer is yes, um, there could be a trade deal, but it would be a fairly minimalist trade deal. That is to say, it would reduce or eliminate most tariffs and quotas. Um, but that's actually the easy bit, because tariffs and quotas are no longer the main impediment to trade, particularly between industrialized countries. Um, that would still result in the imposition of lots of new trade barriers, custom controls, no ta non-tariff barriers, other regulatory barriers between the UK and the EU. Moreover, in order to secure that deal on that timescale, the UK would have to make major concessions in other areas. It will probably have to adopt some elements of the EU's existing regimes on competition policy and state aid, preventing us subsidizing private businesses, and we'll also have to make some concessions on fisheries. So um, it's possible to make a deal, but that what that means is that we will have to make most of the necessary concessions to get that deal done in that time. Interesting. Okay, Jonathan Porters, let's see what happens next, but thank you for your analysis as always.